when people hear that among the factors of jhana are directed thought and evaluation, the question sometimes arises, how do we start doing directed thought and evaluation? And the answer is you're doing it all the time. It's the Buddhist way of describing how we talk to ourselves. And the mind spends a lot of its time talking to itself. It just chatters away. It has nothing to say in particular. It just has random things coming through. And there are many levels of conversation going on. The part of the mind that monitors your digestive system, monitors your placement of the different organs in the body, your limbs, your legs, your arms. And there's a sense of where you are, what time of year it is, what you're going to do tonight, what you did last night. A lot of these conversations are all going on at once, and you're going to have to plow through them as you settle down, because you're going to change the topic of conversation. You're going to focus it on the breath, and as the Buddha said, it's the breath in and of itself. the body in and of itself. You don't want to connect the body to its meaning in the world. In other words, whether people like it, whether it's attractive, whether it can do the work that needs to be done. Just the fact you've got the body here. And that's an important part of the concentration. Because otherwise, once you start thinking about the body, it connects up with the thought about this and the thought about that, and the thoughts begin to spread out and create a web of all kinds of different meanings. How the body fits into a larger pattern of things. It's like language. The words point to one another. Some of them point outside, but a lot of them just point to other words. And they all point in a way that has meaning. And what you're trying to do as you settle down is remove the pointers, remove the meanings, so that the events of the mind the events of the body can be just there, in and of themselves, on their own, unconnected with anything else. And as for whatever comes up, with regard to the world, just regard it as meaningless. The Buddha says, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. We have greed and distress over things that have meanings. So try to cut things down just to individual events, just happening on their own, coming, going away. This is why the Buddha says discernment deals with penetrative insight into arising and passing away. Just seeing things as they come as events, seeing them go away as events. And realizing that some events will be useful for the practice, so for the time being let them have some meaning, but everything else allow it to be meaningless. And as you settle down, you'd, you'd be surprised how many conversations are going on. You clear out one level of conversation, and you find another. Clear out another, and you find one below that. And this is a lot of what concentration is. Cutting all the ties, cutting all the meanings. And this one web of meanings gets cut through. You see another one that you didn't realize was there. You cut through that. The need to keep talking about things, that's a very insistent web of meanings. A lot of implications behind it, a lot of assumptions behind that. And you want to learn how to question them. You try and experiment. In what direction is your mind facing right now? When your eyes are open, obviously it faces toward the front of your face, because that's where your eyes are. Well, that's how it seems. 
But once you close your eyes, why do you have to think the mind has a face in any direction at all? The face belongs to the body. The mind doesn't have a face. Think of it centered in. And as for the solid parts of the body, remind yourself as the body sits here very still. You don't have to think of it as being solid. You can think of it simply as being breath. We think of it as being solid because we have to move it around. Which muscle pulls which other part of the body? And there's a lot of memory and there's a lot of commentary going on in there. But you can drop that for the time being because you're sitting very still. The only movement is the movement of the, the breath. And then you realize you have that perception. The breath comes from the outside. But actually the breath comes from inside. It pulls air in from outside. But it's the energy in the body that allows that air to come in. If it weren't for the energy in the body, the air wouldn't come in. So the real active force in the breath is something that originates here. Hold that perception in mind and see what other perceptions that you ordinarily carry around you're going to be running up against. This ability to question your perceptions is an important part of concentration, because you're unburdening the mind. You begin to see how many preconceived notions you carry around with you. And you start first with your notions about the body. Now these notions are useful for moving the body, looking after it. If there's a pain someplace, you're able to identify where in the body it is. But for the time being, you don't need those perceptions. Or like that old lady in the Thai proverb who carries a big load of straw around on her back. Wherever she goes, she carries the straw because you never know when you're going to need some straw. Of course, when you need the straw, it may not be all that much. And a lot of times when you don't need the straw at all, but she has her stra straw on her back all the time. Well, we carry around a big set of notions, just in case. And you don't realize how heavily burdened the mind is with its assumptions until you can sit down and put yourself in a position where you don't need them. You're allowed to question them and allowed to drop them. And you see what the Buddha said when he set out to Pentecost Rising. There are a lot of details, but the big feature to notice is how much happens before sensory contact. Even before we run into sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, or ideas, we've got a lot of stuff going on. And because it's done in ignorance, that's why it leads to suffering. So when you set down to meditate, as the Buddha said, first your thoughts of sensuality fall away, your thoughts of unskillful qualities, they fall away. Then your directed thought and evaluation falls away. And then the movement of the breath falls away. These different layers of sankara or fabrication fall away one by one by one. And the mind can be very light. The reason we don't experience lightness in the meditation is because we are not light, willing to let go. We feel that we're going to need some straw. So we've got that big load of straw on our backs. And 
the purpose of the concentration is to put us in a position where we can let it go. We don't let it go forever. But for the time being, there are a lot of things you don't need. As the Johns used to like to say when you sit here with your eyes closed, what race are you? What gender? There's nothing in your range of experience to tell you. Of course, those questions are meant to apply to a lot of other things that you carry around. And realize, you're sitting here with your eyes closed, you don't need them. So allow these perceptions to fall away. Allow these various levels of conversation, as soon as you discover one, let it fall away. In the beginning, you hold on to that one conversation about the breath and its relationship to the mind. But once the mind and the breath get snugly put together, then you don't need that. Some people get really scared. If there's nobody talking inside, then where am I? That's their thought. Well, there still will be some subtle perceptions going on. After all, concentration is a series of perception attainments. But there are a lot of perceptions you can let go, and you're perfectly okay. And a lot of activities in the mind you can let go, and you're perfectly okay. And if you identify yourself with that inner conversationalist, you have to realize that sometimes you're identifying with some pretty crazy things. If you need to identify, this is why they talk about being with just awareness itself. Eventually you'll be able to let that go, too. But get used to just being aware, without commentary. Fully alert. And you come to appreciate how much lightness there is. And then you can make that your skill, picking up the assumptions when you need them and putting them down when you don't. Our minds are like those old tank water heaters. They keep water boiled at a high temperature all the time, so it's there when you need it. But it's a huge waste of energy. It's when they developed tankless heaters that they learned how to save a lot. As someone once said, using a tank water heater is like keeping your car running all the time in case you need to jump in the car and drive someplace. You learn to turn the car off when you need it and turn it back on when you do. Heat the water when you need it, turn the heat off when you don't. Use your assumptions when they're needed. Drop them when you don't. You don't have to carry them around. And give yourself time like this where you can set as many things down as possible. As I say, when the breath gets still, the sense of the body begins to turn into a mist, because your shape of the body is defined by how the breath runs. As it gets still, and there's that mist. The perception of form can be dropped. You don't even have to have the idea that there's a body sitting here. This is how you go through the different levels of concentration, realizing you, you're holding on to a perception. It's really unnecessary for the purpose of sitting here very still. And so you peel them off one by one by one, and yet you're fully alert and fully mindful. And 
And again, a sense of how light the mind can be. And that way you have concentration that gives you a pleasant abiding, and you develop mindfulness and alertness, and you gain insight all at once. <laughs>